talk to you. I know. <laughs> like, I love every time there's a crisis, I'm like, I'm going to call Terry. Wait a minute. I'm gonna I did something wrong. I can't out. hear you. Wait. So, you don't, you don't see me? No. So oh, you, I thought you could. There now you can go. you? Boom. Oh my God. Boom. Look at, look at your background. Here's the truth of the matter. We're just build, finishing building this house. So I and just I put just, these up here so it wouldn't be me in a blank wall. <laughs> I love it. I need the flower <laughs> healing right now. I'll take it. Mm. Terry, I'm going to do a little introduction for you. Then I want you to do your own introduction. So people have heard your delicious voice before, your incredible voice, your calming voice. Um, because sadly we lost a friend in common who passed away, Marissa Mayer. And I did a bit of a podcast about it where they got to hear your voice. And so they're hearing you again, a little bit of a different story this time. I'm calling you in for your expertise, um, and your, and your personal experiences and perspectives on what's going on right now. I have a lot of moms that are dealing with teenagers and college age kids. And as this is happening, they're dealing with that battle that you're the expert on because this is the work that you do. You do so many things, but you do this one really well, which is to kind of help people understand the power struggle that they get into with their adolescents and young adults. So I have moms that are like, you know, I forced my kid to come home from college. We've got a wild puppy over here. Oh, I or, love wild puppies. <laughs> or we... Um, my kid called me and said they're ready, or I've got a teenager that's still going out, wants to go out, doesn't want to stay in. So I want to chat about all these things, but more than anything, you have been a mentor for me on so many levels. Um, you make a little appearance in my book, The Ancient Women's Circle, where I get to talk about just the incredible inspiration that you have been to me all these years about gathering women and initiating me into a women's circle. So I owe you so much, uh, mm. just the space that you've held for me. So just on a personal note, Terry's who I call when I'm in a jam, when I'm like, <laughs> I need help. And the things that you say, the magic that comes out of your mouth so naturally is so deeply inspiring for me, for people and for me. And so I really want to kind of dive in today. I'm going to pull back and let you do a little introduction so people so you can say what, what you call yourself in the world or how you ah. <laughs> Not what I'm called in the world, what I call myself. What you call yourself. <laughs> yes. I call myself a behavior management consultant because that's what people want when they call me. What they want is me to help them manage, usually a teenager, but I do work, people call me for kids of all ages, but whether it's a teacher, but mostly parents, how do I manage this behavior, which I feel like is going to be exacerbated by, by everybody having to be home? Or it could be. It could be a good thing. But the main thing that I help people understand is that this adolescent stage of life is not to be feared. What happens is we have a, we have a bunch of cultural suppositions. We don't realize it. Or wherever they come from. They could be familial, they could be religious, they could be all kinds of things. But we have all these supposes that go on in our head when we're dealing with these other beings who are their total other people, which are teenagers. And there's this kind of struggle in us that um, I need to be a good parent. You know, I don't want to mess this up. It all comes from a good place. But what I find is a lot of times parents begin to focus, not consciously, begin to focus on being a good parent instead of what is best for the kid. Do you see the difference? So it, the focus, I know because the only reason I can do all this stuff is because I was on a heap myself. And so I had to learn some things very quickly. And what I learned began to be used in my classroom because I was teaching, began to be used at home. Um, I just did on my, I do a thing called Tuesdays with Terry, uh, which anybody can get through their email. Um, it appears on my YouTube channel and also on my website. But every Tuesday I come out with a little short video. And this one I did just 
recently was about, you know, pulling your hair out that just that frustration because, because Liliana, there was a moment, which I remember vividly and not proudly where I was in my kitchen, literally pulling my hair out. So that's kind of where I was because I loved my kids, but they were out of my control and I really didn't know how to how to, how to manage. And so that's what I help parents with is learning the difference between controlling and managing. And that's kind of, it sort of came out organically just because of my own life, because I became a mother overnight of six kids, as you know, many of whom were already in the, it's so funny that when you talk about your kids, you have to use that word many. Okay. So (laughs) it's like a horde, but a lot of them, a few of them, three or four of them were already in that adolescent or pre-adolescent stage. And, um, that's a difficult stage in our Western society, especially. Um, although I just did a Tuesdays with Terry about the whole uh, big infant syndrome they're having in China. So it's not just a problem here. Um, not l- wanting kids to grow up. And there's a lot of history, like um, academic research about why that's the case here, which I could go into if you want, but also um, what parents could do about it because nobody really wants to, you know, mess their kids up. And I usually get calls from parents who are really doing way better than they think they are. And what I, what I really, really want people to know is that they already have it within them to do what's right or what's best, but they often, we don't know it because we're so either tired or overwhelmed or just stretched too many different ways or frustrated because we don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. And we don't get a lot of support out there in the culture. Like usually they're doing too much. And that's my message. You're probably doing too much. And I learned that from you very early on. Uh, because you were giving me, you know, advice on the porch when I was crying about this and crying about that. The beauty is that you can have access to all of this, not just by signing up to Terry's newsletters and going on her website and following her, but also that um, she has a book out and it's called um, The Identity Crisis of Parenting. I do. I have a copy. It's the only copy I have because it's new. It's the new and revised because I took stuff out. See, it's not that big. One of the things, Liliana, that I work with, whether I'm doing a book for parents or teachers, I don't want them to be big because ain't nobody got time for all that. You know, I got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. I look up what's available out there for teachers. It's just unbelievable. Six modules and 12 things to, and for parents, every time a a kid needed discipline, they had to remember 12 words. I'm like, 12 words? I usually can't remember my kids' names. I'll have to go down the list and be like, what's your name? Just what's your name right now? I cannot remember because you're just aggravating me. So, you know, uh, you, we, we don't have time for all that. And, and we don't. I mean, I didn't. And, and, and I, that's why your book is awesome because I get to tell people all over the world to please get on Amazon if they have it in their country and get it ordered because when I say the title, it's the identity crisis of parenting that says it all right there. Mm -hmm. And it's an empowering book. It is the most incredible book you have ever read about parenting. Parenting books make me so tired and bored and yours is just fascinating, entertaining, there's stories in it. And it helped me really embody, as you said, what did you say? Discipline versus management? What was your control? The difference between managing and controlling. It's a big difference. And what we think we, we have to do is control our kids because it's scary. Here's the, here's the bottom line. And you probably know this way more than most people. When you have a kid, you risk losing that kid, right? Any relationship that we have, we risk losing. So as parents, usually kids open our hearts in a way that they've not been opened before in a, in a love that we haven't yet experienced. So a lot of fear comes in. I don't want to lose this kid. You know, there's a, a lot of things that we can be afraid of. That's which the is, bottom line. If you think about it, I don't want my kid to die. <laughs> that's really what we don't want, you know? And so if we are able to step back from that and understand that you already took that risk, 
Okay, so let's let's focus on another set of risks. So the risk of not uh, allowing that kid to grow up. That's a whole other set of risk. Um, you could end up with a kid who's alive but not living if they don't know how to live. You see what I'm saying? So, hundred um, percent, girl. Yeah, Beautiful. yeah. It's what we all share in common as parents, and people don't say it. You don't go to meetings and go, "Yeah, my basic fear is that my kid's going to die." especially when we're teenagers. I mean, when we have teenagers and we have a very healthy kids, um, but that's what it really is. So it comes from a real deep place of love. Um, and it doesn't stop, right? Because even when you're parenting adult adults, you know, they're your kids, but they're adults, there's still transitions that need to happen. And I remember mm -hmm. having a client who I had a toddler at the time and she said, you know, I was, she was having, you know, sympathy for me and my toddler situation. And I said, Oh, you have adult kids, you know, naively, whew, you know, that's wonderful. And she says, <laughs> imagine that your three-year-old is walking around the room with a metal fork and just jamming it in all the outlets, <laughs> but you are bound and gagged and tied to a chair in the center of the room and you can do nothing. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. like, Horrified. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's what I, I deal with. I, what I say is parenting, this is a big aha for most people. It does come to an end. It comes to an end. But you never stop being mom. You never stop being dad. But you don't parent 40-year-olds. It's disrespectful, to say the least. And I tell you, as much practice as I have in this field, I still have to practice with my grown kids. My daughter just came and spent a week with me, left her three kids and came and spent a week with me. We had such a great time because we couldn't go anywhere because of coronavirus. So we actually had to stay together and talk and chat. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, she's 40 years old and an incredible woman who honestly, I just now am seeing for the first time how incredibly she, because what we have to do is make that flip from this is not a child anymore. Because at least I'm from the South and I grew up in this culture where mama's always got to be mama and you always see your kids as not quite capable because they're just kids. No, 40 years old. Okay. Are they going to do things like I would do them? Mm -mm. Nope. In fact, this is funny. My, one of my sons-in-law said to me years and years ago, he said, I think when your daughter, who, he was married, who he's married to, when she gets older, she's going to be just like you. And I said, you better hope not, buddy, because she ain't going to last a day with you if she's just like me. <laughs> you know, he, of course, laughed, but we have very different personalities, you know. And right, right. So just realizing that you're always going, I think of the word parenting, I equate it with shepherding. You, you kind of help these people through wherever they're choosing to go to help them get to a goal. That comes to an end. And that comes to an end whenever you want it to come to an end. Usually when they go off to college, you have to start stepping back. And, and I'm just reading a book written by the dean of Stanford University, dean of students or freshmen, and she's written a book about how to let your kids grow up because so many parents are still wanting to be there. This is, to me, I thought of college as a semi, pretty safe place that kids can grow up grow into themselves and have little people around looking, looking out for them, or at least knowing if they do or don't show up at night. But yeah, it evidently it's a big problem that parents can't seem to let go. And I think it comes from, they're not, they want to be good parents. They're not, they don't know the, when they're supposed to let go. Nobody, that's why I love Erickson's developmental stages because it, those stages at each stage, you see what should be happening in this kid's life. Okay. What should be happening? Okay. It's like a pebble in a pond from infancy. When you get to the adolescent stage, then you can, you can start helping them to be adults. People begin and their kids fuss and fight with them because they aren't willing to do that. They aren't willing to say kindly, you can do this, but here's your choice. Or here's what I'm going to do. And here's what I'm not going to do in this situation as a parent, you know, which I talk about in my book. It's way let's too launch much into that a little oh, bit. Okay. okay. Let's get some practical information just because what do you have advice for parents right now that are dealing with this pandemic that's happening, this crisis, the situation, and they have adolescents at home 
you know, how do you see it? Should our kids be structured to do things all day? What happens when they want to go out the door and go hang out with their friends? And I'm open to you talking about it in stages. You know, for adolescents, I would do this for college bound, you know, college kids that are back home. Yeah. What I would say is because of the restrictions that are national and global at this point, I would recommend that everybody stay home because that's what we're supposed to be doing. The beautiful thing about it is we have this. I mean, where are you right now? In the Pacific Northwest? And I'm in the South. I'm in New Orleans. And we can talk and chat. And kids have that. All of us have that. We have that. We have a social outlet. There's no isolation. <laughs> I mean, but if a kid, if I had a college age kid who said, I'm going to go hang out with my friends, I'm like, well, stay there because I don't want you bringing whatever you just possibly exposed yourself to home. That's a little much. I mean, I, I, that sounds harsh, but of course, if I, don't I were working. I think work, it sounds harsh. I don't well, if I were working with a client, we could finesse it to where it didn't sound so brutal, <laughs> you know, when you're actually talking to another human. But truth of the matter is, they're, when they're old enough to make those adult kind of decisions, then they're old enough to live with those adult consequences. And that's where, as a parent, we do have the right to say, here's what I will do, and here's what I won't do. When you're home and you're a teenager, I will give you however many hours we can sort it out. You want three hours a day. You want in the morning, the evening, at night, on social media, fine. But there has to be some structure because we as humans crave structure. The, the sun goes and comes every 24 hours. You know, we're pretty used to rhythmic balances. Nature helps us along with that. So to just be letting kids stay up all night at any age is probably not a great idea. I would just encourage people to do what they do when the kids are at home. You, there's structure. There's a time for this. There's a time for that. There's a lot of free time. Some of them are going to have to be going to school. And I think uh, what I'm hearing is lots of school districts are doing different things. Also, people are doing some great things. I see that authors are, start, are reading their books uh, online. Um, if people are on social media, they know all this stuff. There are some teachers who are from preschool on up who are offering lessons. I saw, who'd I see? Math, dad, and science mom were kind of giving people, you know, so there, I love the fact that even though what this is doing is we're seeing, as Mr. Rogers says, we're finding the helpers. There's no reason not to find the help that you need because a lot of people are out there helping. So just because we're in our homes is not a bad thing. I read an essay of a woman from China in the middle, in the epicenter of the uh, quarantine, if you will, who lives on the 25th floor in her apartment building. They have to have their groceries delivered. I think they've already been in there for a few weeks now, at least, maybe eight, I'm not sure. But she was saying how she lived, she's lived in this big city for so long and she didn't know there were birds in the city. She never heard them. And she can hear them now. And the air is much clearer. And her family's home all at the same time, whereas they're usually not. They're running, you know, doing. So, and they're doing a lot of things together. She, she finds it very valuable, you know. And that sort of helped me sort of flip that switch. But we that. have things like this, where we can talk to anybody anywhere in the world just about, right? So there's no real social isolation. There's physical isolation, but we can. So you're saying that. don't fall into your kids um, because it goes with that thing of like over parenting or trying to make your kids happy or feeling like, you know, if they go to the door and then sort of the power struggle, you're, you're just kind of like cut the bullshit. You're good. You're going to stay home. Yeah. You can socialize on social media. Yeah. Um, and so my daughter and I, uh, I had her kind of, I had a conversation with her and was like, what do you want to do? And this is actually what our project is. This is her homeschool project. Her school hasn't really sent out other than resources. They're not sending like online stuff mm -hmm. like some of the other schools are. Uh -huh. So um, this is our project. So we decided she calls it Lotus Lantern Worldwide. And she came up with a logo. And she's been building this, the web page. And she says the tagline is something like, it's not a place for conspiracies or telling you about the fears you have to have, but a place to share perspectives. How old is she? 
She is going to be nine. What the heck? Yeah. That's amazing. Congrats. Kudos. Oh so this my is goodness. Our project, but it, it is, you know, I'm working from home and she's, I'm giving her my computer to do something and we're talking about what's reasonable. Um, and then what would you say? So basically what you're saying is if you've got a college age kid who's giving you a hard time, you just have to let them deal with the consequences for the most yeah. part of yeah. that exposure. I mean, to me, it feels like if, if they are willing, able to make adult decisions and they have to deal with adult consequences. Now, if they're living in your house and you're sort of supporting them that way, then you, as equal as we all are as beings on the earth, you, you have a little bit more say so about it in my book, in my opinion, because you're providing a lot for this person, right? So it just is a matter of respect. And I think parents aren't used to thinking about what they provide. Most parents that I work with are stuck on what they're not doing right. They don't even look at they're providing shelter, they're providing food, they're providing warmth, they're providing love, they're providing all kind of extra stuff. They are really doing a lot for this other human. And I don't think it's a lot to ask that you not expose yourself to something that you're going to bring in this house. And there's a lot of stuff they could be doing. Actually, for, for most people that I work with, I sort of, what we end up doing is, what they end up doing usually is having to scale back a little bit because there's so many things that we just presume we're supposed to be doing when you really have the 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 gift that we're given and the responsibility are these lives who are right in front of us. And that is the focus. I mean, that's kind of the contract we made when we decided to have these kids and bring them into our home. I contract that I'm going to shepherd you through this phase of life until you can do it on your own. That's pretty basic. That's the contract. So our part is to focus on that. And that doesn't mean you're, you're there 24 seven or anything like that. It just means that you're going to do the best you can to help this person grow up. And part of that growing up is dealing with consequences. Yeah. And, and you talk about them. Yeah. You talk about that in your book because it's so hard to not try to rush in and protect, but yeah. you have some stories in your book and I would love it if you have a story you could share that's personal or even just with a client where, you know, that person is holding on super tight and then all of a sudden the consequence, I don't know if it's in your, your revision of the book, but I love the story of your son breaking the glass in the garage. And <laughs> that was a good lesson for me and for him because I was just now learning this. And he was getting out of the car after wrestling practice one day. He was very hot, very tired, starving as wrestlers did in those days. And he was trying, he had his arms full of his gym bag and his backpack. And he was trying to kick his shoe off to get in the house. And when he, he kicked his shoe and it flew right into the garage door and shattered it, shattered the, one of the little windows in the garage door, the panel. And he just immediately looked at me and he said, I didn't mean to do that. This was my new practice, Liliana. Instead of going, really, really, you couldn't wait? to get your shoe off. I mean, what the heck? I'm going to have to go in and cook supper and now we got to pay for this. Okay. All that. So what I did was I said, um, I could see you didn't, I got sympathy, sympathy, right? I really was. Cause I could see he was worried. He was ready for me to yell at him. And I said, uh, I can see you didn't mean to do it. And he goes, no mom, I really didn't. And I said, I know I get it. I can see that. I see it was an accident. It wasn't my fault. I said, well, it kind of was your fault, but I know you didn't mean to do it. And so what it turned into was him just getting really frustrated because I was playing a new game. I changed the rules. He did not know how to deal. He was ready to defend himself and to argue with me which is what I did, which by the way, there's a link on my website for a free audio download about how to stop arguing right now, today over, really. So they could go on my website at www.yarcoach.com and download that. So he was ready to argue with me. And what it turned into was I said, I could see you, you, you didn't mean to do it, but you're, how are you going to fix it? What do you mean? So why are you going to fix it? I don't, I said, well, I think, you know, 
you got to call a glass person. They'll come and do it. And I think you have money, right? Yeah, I have money. I don't know how to do that. I'm only 13. I can't talk. I don't know how to talk to adults, which was true because I had never given him the opportunity to, to act like an adult, to be an adult, to talk like one. In fact, I used to answer for my kids when we're in a room and somebody would ask my kid a question. How old are you now? Oh, he's 10. Really? Anyway, that was just a little thing. And it, 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 I still see it happen all the time. So I was just kind of right here in front of my mind. But so he did, he, he called up a glass company. He rained, he asked how much it would cost. He went, I told him what to say and he said it. And then he hung up and he said, I think I could do better than that. So he called another glass company, got the money. And I was up cooking supper, they came, he went and paid them and got it all taken care of. So when his dad got home, we had a very different story to tell then. The garage door is broken, he broke it, he's in his room, you gotta do something with this kid, he's out of control. It was like, hey, this kid got this window fixed, he's only 13, can you believe that? And he's like, really? And we just said all that in front of him. So that to me was like a big milestone for me as a parent, because what happens is we, the way we act causes reaction. No two ways about it. The way we act causes reaction. So my chain, and that's what I help parents deal with. The difference between controlling and managing is you can't control them. And if you can really take that in and understand that you cannot control another person's behavior ever, we think we can, but you can't. I mean, you could tell your two-year-old to stop crying and screaming. That's not going to make them stop crying and screaming. You can tell somebody, I'm going to do this if you don't do that, and they might do it anyway. So managing is, is a whole different ball game and so much easier than trying to control something you cannot control. I love it. And this parlays us into your second book, which is all around classroom management for teachers. It is. I mean, specifically, it's for secondary teachers of at-risk students, because that's what, who I spent my career teaching, kids who were, you know, expelled or in kid jail or whatever, the gamut of that, but um, which was so wonderful and fulfilling. And um, uh, Are the... Really stories you could share from that book or, or just give us a little bit of some information, a practical application for a teacher because um, I know they're all so stressed out with. Yeah. Women. Yeah. Part of, yeah, I think there is, but the main, the main part of the book, I just give five, five, oh, proven formulas for boosting your effectiveness or some help from the Beatles to make five simple tweaks to get the classroom you want just five. Because there again with teachers, and this has to do with the history of teachers in America, they almost always do too much, <laughs> feel too responsible. And they're made to feel responsible by people who taught them in college, the education system in general. And you have some teachers who teach, you know, 150 kids a day. And there's no way to be personally invested in each kid, nor should you be. So what I, what I, my main reason for writing this is the same thing I did with parents. Know your role, know your role. And your role is different from your identity. Your role as a parent is not going to always be there. In fact, one day the tables are going to turn, your kid's going to be taking care of you. You'll always be their mom, but you're not going to have that role of parenting. And the same thing with a teacher. When three o'clock comes, your role ends as a teacher. Your, your job is to teach. And see, we haven't been taught that as teachers. We're, we're, we're like, make sure they're fed, make sure they're taken care of. If they haven't eaten breakfast, give them breakfast. Oh, and they need to pass all these year in tests because you need to teach them that information too. It's just way too much sugar for a dime, way. And because teachers are big hearted and creative, they, and most of them feel called to teach, they fall right into it. But it's not like you leave kids hanging. <laughs> you, that's why it's so important that schools have a system built so that everybody's doing their job. I, I'll give you an example. There was a, a social worker from the Department of Human Services who told me that there was a, teach, a high school teacher who had a student in her class who had gone through a really rough time, and he wanted to play soccer, and it cost 
$500 by the time everything was said and done. To play soccer, there's no way he had that. So the social worker said, we have that. I can take care of that. That's part of what we can do for him. And the teacher said, oh, no, no, no. We're gonna, we're, we're, he's part of our classroom family. We're all, you know, supportive and we're raising money. We're having bake sales and we're doing all kinds of things to raise the $500. And in my mind, I'm thinking that's really nice. But um, the point is to get the kid the $500, A, and B is who's teaching your class while you're having bake sales the stuff that the kids are going to get graded on. Now, I know we can all, we could talk about the pros and cons and the back and forth of that. I, I get, I get that that's kind of hard for some people to hear, but when there's already a structure in place, a, a lot of teachers, like a lot of parents feel like martyrdom is part of the job. It's not part of the job. And a lot of people don't want to be healed from that. I will say from the get go. That's why I work with I talk to parents before I agree to take them on because um, there are certain things that have, you have to do. Well, they got to be ready for you, Terry. Well, the two. And, and I have resisted your information and, you know, I've, I've had you sit and tell me something and then I'm walking away thinking that'll never work. And then I try it first. <laughs> well, um, I get and, that. Trust and, me. I understand that. And my partner does parent coaching from a very different perspective, more from mentorship and the high risk kids that she was in. She doesn't have any personal parenting experience, but I do the same thing with her when she gives mm -hmm. me advice. I'm just like, that's never going to work. And then it works. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. we've got to be ready to work with you for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I, I, I always work with parents or teachers or whomever in four week consecutive weeks, because one time doesn't do it because it takes practice. And it's a little practice that you have to practice to, to get good at or to be able to do it. But before I agree to work with them, they have to agree to two things. One is if your kid's 10 years old or older, they have to be able to do their own laundry. You, you must stop doing their laundry. And that seemed, that seems really ridiculous, but there's a whole reason for that. And the, the two is you have to agree to take a bath every day, if possible, because most parents think they don't have time. I remember a woman standing in my kitchen when I had all my six kids at home and it was just the height of everything. And an older woman was there visiting with her daughter with me. And I was taking this new sort of colon drink to help me get energy, which I hated. I hated to go in the kitchen every morning because I had to take this nasty stuff. But, I, and I was trying something like, oh, I got this, I'm gonna get more energy. And she looked at me and she goes, well, why don't you just rest? I got so mad, I'm like, rest? I don't have time to rest. I have six kids, I have a full-time job. We have church, we have band, we have sports, we have extracurricular, you know, I don't have time to rest, but she was absolutely right. I did have time to rest, but you know what? You can't think you're in control if you, if you give yourself a time out. Who's going to be running things? Sad. And I was very proud of the fact that I hadn't taken a bath in years. I only took showers, you know, because I have time. So you you connect to the martyr thing. You've experienced oh gosh. it. Oh, yeah. And you know what it's like to parent and not take care of yourself. You know what it's yeah. like to resist really empowering your kids because you think you're going to do it wrong or maybe they're going to get hurt. And that's why you're so good to work with because you actually, you. every time I've resisted you, you're like, yeah, I can understand why this is hard, you know? Yeah. But just try it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and so you don't I, have to try it. <laughs> you don't try have it. to try it. But <laughs> when I have tried your tips and your tricks, uh, despite my fear, it has worked out really well. And so Good. I really think that uh, if people do parent coaching with you, it sounds like a gift. It sounds like an opportunity to have that self-care time when they're working with you. Yeah, and, I hope so. And you work with teachers as well? I do, but normally in the past, I've worked with teachers like it, it, in groups, like their schools will have me in to talk about behavior management in the classroom or. Can you brag um, about yourself a little bit? I just don't feel like you're bragging I, enough because didn't your, like your system get like mandated by the courts for some of the kids? Well, like what was Not that? exactly. It was adopted by one of the school districts I worked for as a class, a social class for students. But 
what happened was because my classroom was, you know, successful when I taught expelled kids, right? The bad kids, which I have a lot of stories about in both books. But because of that, then the truancy judge began to send parents to my workshop in lieu of paying a fine, which was so great because then I had these parents typically were so mad because it's like, why do I have to be here? I didn't skip school. Why am I here? So, so that first night it gave us the opportunity to go, well, let's, let's look at that. Why are you here? Well, it was either this or pay a fine. So you made the choice to be here, right? Yeah, you did. And so the, the thing is we victimize ourselves without even realizing we're doing it because we think that's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and many people have vi- been victimized by their teenagers and don't even realize it, you know. And some people, I have to tell you, are really comfortable in that. They love being able to complain. That's the payoff. They love, I don't want to say being a martyr, but they love that it's hard. They love... Oh, you know, because when they do that, they feel like they're just working harder than most people, which is what they expect. And it doesn't have to be that way. That's the biggest message. Yeah. It doesn't have I to be love, that way. Oh, yeah. I love so it. I love so it. when I, when I talked to, I'm trying to think, I wish I would have talked. Um, there was one kid, I guess I'll tell you, to allow consequences for teachers is difficult. There was a kid I had in my class who had homework from his home school. He couldn't go to that school because he was expelled. He couldn't play sports. He was really, really mad about it. But he had to, he was one to graduate. So he had to get a class from his school and a teacher agreed to send the work over. And we had time when we worked independently. And one day he was just huffing and puffing. And I walked over and I said, what's up with you? He said, I hate this stuff. I hate doing homework. And I said, well, why are you doing it? Well, my teacher said, I said, well, let's, didn't, didn't you say you wanted to graduate? Yeah, I said I wanted to graduate. I said, well, I already graduated, so we're not here for me. I'm here for you. How can I? He goes, he puts his pencil down. I hate it when you say that. I hate it when you say you already graduated. And I'm, I said, well, the first day you came here, I asked you why you're here. You said, I want to graduate. So let me help you. Do you need this course to graduate? Yeah, but you need to nag me. I said, I, do, I need to nag you? Yeah, like my mom does. She nags me. I said, does that work? No. <laughs> It was just so cute. It's just asking these questions. And that's what I tell parents or teachers. Stop telling and start asking. And that's the that's the number one thing. When you question people, then you allow them to think critically. You see, you allow them to think, well, well, why am I? Because, you know, I used to tell them my door's not locked in my classroom. You don't have to be here, which opens up a whole can of worms. You want to leave? Well, let's call your mom. Let's call your parole officer or whoever it is. And then you have irate parents, which was great with me because many of those parents were so disenfranchised, they've never talked to the school, right? So at least we got them in here and we're all at the table and we're all talking. It was beautiful. But, you know, yeah, just helping them think critically, even the parents, you know, it's like, well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was great. So I love doing this because it makes a difference. You know, I have at this point, I'm going, getting ready to have my 14th grandchild. I'm getting ready. I know, right? (laughs) So I don't have time still to for people for things that don't work. I don't want to burden people with things that don't work. I want them to be able to come to me and we're going to have these sessions and then I'm going to be available to you and you're going to have a change. You're going to have a change. And what I it was funny because I had a parent call me a consult about working together and she goes, okay, well, I'll bring my boys in and I'm like, yeah, no, no. I don't work with the kids because I, I, I can work with kids, but then they have parents who are still over them who don't get it. No, no. I begin, I work with parents now. I need you to come in. Oh, okay. Okay. So, because what we do causes, causes a, a change in the kids. Even I had a parent call me one time crying. She had been to one of my workshops only one night and she called me before work the next day. She said, Last night, my daughter came in my room and talked to me for the first time since she's been in high school. Oh, she wow, was in tears wow, because wow. her daughter treated her like a piece of crap and she was in tears. And that's why I like doing what I do. It's not a lot of work, but it's a lot of outcome. 
So it's fun. It's fun for me and I enjoy it. And it's no BS, really. I ain't got time for stuff like that. What, I, what happened was I was in grad school and I was struggling with these adolescent kids in my life, in my home. And I learned about the several things. One of the stages of development. I learned about the anger cycle. I learned about all these things that I had no clue about. And I began to put them to work in my home and my home changed. Then began to put them to work in the classroom, the classroom. So it was like, I didn't make this stuff up. I just brought it all together, you know? And it's just these little concepts that make that switch. Cause really I feel, I feel for parents. They have a real big burden, you know, they burden themselves with um, that responsibility and they, they feel that burden, you know, it's not easy, it especially when you're easy. busy, which is a especially. good thing about isolating. Cause now you don't have to be, <laughs> it's true. It's you true. can stay home and go, I'm not exhausted. Oh, I didn't have to go anywhere today. Yep. Yeah. There's definitely some waking up that's happening for sure. I believe it. I totally believe that. My partner and I were talking about how it's the end of convenience um, because there's this awareness of like, oh, what happens if I have to be self-reliant? What happens? Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a change of thinking as we've mm -hmm. been kind of just going at this exponential rate in our world. Um, and to go back to say to what you were saying earlier, again, my partner and I always talk about do-gooders, bleeding hearts, and how oftentimes that's the thing that gets us the most in trouble. When you're talking about the story with the social worker and the class raising funds for the kid, I was also thinking about how the perception would be for that kid that needed that $500. You know, yeah. sometimes just having the $500 that someone can give you um, because it's, it's not a kid's fault that they're in that right. situation. Right. Um, and sometimes it's not the parent's fault. You know, it's mm -hmm. this, it's the socioeconomic situation mm -hmm. that we have going on. And so, yes, poverty is real. And so for us to not have to act like this kid is a problem or just like a charity or a I case, a case. That's, yeah. that's what I found with the kids that I used to teach. They had come up usually in some system, whether it's the, the, juvenile system, the foster system, whatever, um, welfare, whatever you want to call it. It was all sorts of that. And they were always the case. And so when they came in my classroom, I, there were things I, I, I expected them to do or I allowed them to do to help me, to help each other. So they are not the case. They're empowered to go, oh, I really do know math more than the class. Oh, I really can clean these boards or whatever it was. But I could see, I learned that just from watching those kids light up. I really didn't do it on purpose, but I realized just what you're saying. I don't want to be the case. You know, we all want to help. We all want to do. Um, so that's really empowering. Purpose. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about purpose. And I think kids with so much convenience these days and so many bleeding heart parents that feel guilty about every little thing. Yeah. Takes yeah. all of the purpose and direction away from that mm -hmm. kiddo. Um, how, um, another thing that people are really asking me about right now is, you know, it's kind of a reverse. You were speaking to that earlier of like one day we're going to be taken care of by our kids. I have a lot of clients who are worried about their elderly parents with this pandemic and not being mm. able to go out. And a lot of their parents, a lot of people in their fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties are just like, I can do whatever I want. I'm invincible. Do you have a way that we could apply some of the concepts that you shared for that? If I'm in the role of over caring for my parent and feeling like, you know, they shouldn't be leaving the house. Cause I was even doing a little bit of that with my assistant. Like you shouldn't, you know, your daughter isn't here to patrol you. So, you know, and she was kind of like trying to manage me. <laughs> Well, I think it would be the same. I mean, I don't know exactly specifically what you're dealing with with your clients, but I think it would be in general the same mm -hmm. if I'm responsible for someone. Now, now there's a difference between thinking I'm responsible and actually being responsible. If you're caretaking for a parent who's living with you or in the space with you, that's really different from someone living on their own who is still self-supporting, even though we like to try to, you know, help. I always like to redefine the word help. That's another video. But so I would say the same thing. We have, here we are in our house, mom, and you live with us and nobody's going anywhere. That's just it. Unless you don't want to live with us, 
you know, unless, and, and of course I'm, our time is short, so I'm being kind of short, <laughs> but there are ways to have these conversations respectfully and to say, this is, this is what I don't want to infect myself or anybody who lives here. So this is what we have to do. And sometimes aged parents too are all about following the rules. I don't know how old your clients are in general, but it's like, if that's the rule, I'm not going to do it. Well, if they grew up in the sixties, they probably want to do the opposite. <laughs> if that's the rule, I ain't doing it. So I ain't going to listen to the man. But anyway, it's the same kind of thing. And I think what complicates it, it's really easy to see when you can pull back and detach. What complicates it is emotion, you know, that just emotional tie up and tie in. So even though we have really high, we may have a really high IQ, if our emotional intelligence isn't that high, it really dumbs us down. It's why we make mistakes when we're upset or frantic or, you know, it's why we don't do what we would have done if that emotion hadn't been involved. So I would suggest really CTFD, you know what I'm saying? I mean, just calm down and back up and take a look at the situation as if it were someone else. I find that really helpful. What yeah, would I say? Mm -hmm. What would I, and I, I had to, you know, learning how to detach and love is a practice, right? Mm -hmm. With your kids or with anybody. So is that help? Is that what you mean by? It, that's exactly what I wanted. How mm. do I apply that to, oh, I'm worried about my assistant and should she be going out? Does she know, has she seen the news? You know, those kinds of things. You're like, you're really what I call the level of responsibility. What level of responsibility am, am I at internally? And I'll share a tool real quick for that. Um, what I want to say is that you can find out about Terry. We're going to have her, all of her information listed, um, follow her, get on her newsletter. Um, and my A class that I teach that you can get online, that's DIY, that's all about looking at your level of responsibility. So it blends really nicely with working right. with Terry because we have kind of the same concept of what is help? Is help really help? Mm -hmm. Am I really helping? And the stories that I tell, and I've done a couple podcasts about it, you can go back and listen to them, is, um, you know, if I'm uh, over-functioning, right, as you're talking about, then it kind of yeah. takes that opportunity away for that co-creative experience. What can we create here? So... What I do for myself is I feel my level of responsibility. So for me, it was my assistant. And so I close my eyes and I sense it and I go, okay, I'm worried about her. My level of responsibility, scale of one to 10. What number is that? 10 is high, one is low. So I'm asking myself, what's the level of responsibility that I feel in my body for her, her safety, her livelihood? And I'm using the word responsibility in kind of a bad way, like it's negative a little bit, the way it's kind of a dirty word. And so <laughs> 10 is high, one is low. And I'm going, man, it's like a nine. I'm checking in with myself going, that's a nine. That doesn't work for me to just go, well, I need to get down to a one. I actually have to take my body down those steps, mm. down those gears. So imagine the nine in my mind, feel it. Yep, I'm accepting that I'm at a nine. I don't want to be that. That doesn't help her. That doesn't help me. Now I'm going to picture the number eight and ask my body to match that vibration. I'm going to imagine the number seven, ask my body to feel the seven. And I'm going to get down to where I feel comfortable. It's not to get to a one or a zero. It's just like, well, where do I feel yeah. expansive, relaxed, mm -hmm. less stressed out? Mm -hmm. And so that's just a quick one that people can that's do. That's really good. And yeah. that's really good. And I might add, if I could, if you can, after that's done, if you can have a conversation, just so you're clear and say, listen, you're an adult. Here's my thinking. Here's my, but you can do whatever you want to do. I just want you to know, I love you. And if you go out there, you can't come back in here. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> that is crucial. That is so important what you're saying, because Oftentimes people are like, I'm getting a premonition or I'm worried about this person. Should I tell them? And I'm like, only if that's the right thing for you. If you're like, I need to actually just say this out loud to you, which is, as you're saying, this is my rule. Like I need to communicate this to you. This is where I'm at. And you want to do that from as neutral a place. Yeah. Otherwise, and loving people because we love people, right? It comes from love. Yes. <laughs> it does. It all does. That's the honest truth. 
Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good one because what we don't usually do is take the time, whether that's takes 15 or 30 seconds to do what you just said. Breathe that in, let it be what it is, and then come down to, you know, does this person have a mother? Do they have someone who's responsible? Do they have a partner? Because that that comes from that that wanting to take a place that's not your place in their life, right? That place is right for you and your kids, for sure, your partner, for sure. But you don't have that kind of contract, you know, with them. And I think that's really important, really important. And my uh, assistant handled me real well. (laughs) Yeah, but you're so kind. You're so loving. She was like, all right, I hear you. You know, like yeah, apparently right. you need right. to be reassured, so I will do that. But yes. that wasn't my intention, right? I wasn't trying to get her to do emotional labor. Right. But when I recognized that and she was giving me that feedback in a kind way, like, mm-hmm. oh, honey, okay, this is mm-hmm. what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I could check myself. I'm like, look at your level of responsibility <laughs> right now. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Because yeah. we all have that. Totally. We all, especially in the business that you're in and I'm in, where you, you care about the people that you're dealing with. We're caring people and I deal with caring people and we could just care each other to death. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it's like, let's back up and see what redefining that word help. When I'm dealing with parents, it's like, are you helping that kid progress to the next level by doing this for them? I, I use this little, this little really quick, quick story. It, it would be like saying to your daughter, Honey, I studied for your algebra test, so you are going to do great, right? Or go ahead and eat that pizza because I ran three miles for you today. Go. It's, it's ludicrous. It's insane. But that's what we do. We think by doing something for them, trying, totally. uh, yeah, they're going to be able to do it. So, yeah. Well, Terry, thank you so much. Oh. I intended for this to be 45 minutes and we've gone to the hour because oh my goodness, everything that you said is so valuable. Um, thank I you don't... again so much for being thank on you. time out of your busy quarantined life. I know. Life I is know. Still happening. It, it is. is. Thank you for connecting. I know oh that you have God. clients yeah. who are really worried. And so thank you for letting me talk to you again and for giving me, I feel honored. You are appreciate it so Thank much. You so much. I, I love you. I know you. I'm so lucky. Bye, sweetie. Bye. <laughs>